Debbie Tripp is an abductee contacting of ET UFO phenomena, a board certified hypnotherapist, advanced EFT, which stands for Emotional Freedom Technique or Therapy Practitioner, an energy therapist, more than 25 years of experience in the alternative health field, and a member of the American Hypnosis Association, the Sound Healers Association, and MUFON. She is also the Tennessee Support Facilitator of Starborn Support and runs monthly support groups in, Nash in the Nashville, Tennessee area. She has been a guest on numerous radio shows and is in the process of writing two books, both of which will be available in early 2005. Given our time constraints, I will leave this very distinguished introduction at this, and I'd just like you to have join me in welcoming from Tennessee, Debbie Trump. Well, good morning, everyone. And I want to thank Audrey and everyone for having me here to tell my story. It took me a while to come out of the abduction closet. Um, I started in an online support group that I was invited to by Misha Johnston. That was a wonderful source at the time for me. Um, but David Chase will be speaking after me. Uh, I met him in that group. And I had a really hard time using my real name. I didn't want my real name out there, and I drove David crazy with, I need a pseudonym. What pseudonym should I use? Um, and I stuck with that for a little while. And then I met Suzanne Chancellor online, and we had some similarities in our experiences, and she had her radio show, Random Alien Brain Droppings, and invited me onto the show. And that was the first radio interview that I did. And she encouraged me to use my real name. And even though I was very apprehensive, I did it anyway, and I was just amazed at how liberating that was to come out and use my real name. So my experiences, they began, my conscious experiences began in November of 2011. And that first experience, I, I had chalked it up to a dream. I had come home from a sleep study because I had had years of insomnia. And, you know, when you do these sleep studies, you're there most of the night. And they sent me home around 5 in the morning. And I was pretty wide awake at that point. And I did some things around the house and finally got into bed to read a little while and fell asleep around 7 o'clock in the morning. And that is when I dreamt what I call your typical abduction scenario. And what had happened was I was just suddenly looking at the bottom of a craft and a beam of light came down and I could feel this suction just pulling me up into the beam of light. And it reminded me of a dream that I would have once or twice a year, which was a tornado dream. And it was that same kind of suction. And, you know, knowing now what I know, I look back on those tornado dreams and I wonder, you know, was that just a screen memory? I don't know. But in this particular situation, I'm, I'm going up through this beam of light and I felt like I was just kicking all my arms and legs. And then I heard a male voice say, now Debbie, just relax. You know we need to do this. And I just surrendered. I just said, oh, okay. Here we go again. And I felt as if I had done it a hundred times before. <laughs> so I, when I, later in the day, I realized I had the start of a sty in my left eye, and I never get those. And I, a couple of days after that, I started to get really sick. And then I was really, really sick and went to the doctor and they thought it was strep throat but that came out negative and my neck was out to here and this rash started on the right side and i thought my goodness this infection is so bad it's coming through my skin i had to go through two different rounds of antibiotics and it took 
several weeks for me to get back on my feet. Um, but this is a picture of the neck rash. And I just want to tell you that anytime I have an experience, this neck rash appears. Sometimes I'll get the sty, just the start of it, and then it goes away in a day or two. But I always have the neck rash. So a few weeks later, I was at my parents' house, and I was telling them, obviously this dream stuck with me. Because um, at the time, I wasn't a big dreamer. I didn't remember a lot of my dreams, and if I did, they usually weren't disturbing. So I started to tell my parents about this dream, and my mother said, you know, that's really odd. Um, these are my parents. They're in their 80s. And they live just around the corner from us. And my dad walks their little beagle every night around 9 o'clock. My mother said, your father saw something in the sky like several nights around that time a few weeks ago. And it, and it all happened in the span of like a week and a half. And she, who has very bad legs, uh, she doesn't get out of the house very much because she can't walk well. But my dad brought her outside after he came home from walking the dog to see what was in the sky. And this is what they saw. She, he did this the first two times she came out to see him. And she drew these. It was like a golden ring and you could see the sky through the ring, and she described it kind of like flames going around in a circle. Now, the third thing my father saw, we don't know what it was because he came in the house very shaken, and he said, I don't know what that was, but I don't want to talk about it. And we still don't know what he saw. Another odd thing was this, uh, is a picture that a friend of mine took. She owns a metaphysical bookstore, and one night she was outside and she saw something in the sky and took a picture of it. It was probably about a year later that uh, she came to me with her telephone and said, look at this. I, you know, I took this picture a while back. I, I don't remember when I took it. And I looked at it and I said, well, yeah, that looks like something. And I said, Do you, know, you don't know when you took it? And she said, no. And she had one of those little flip phones. So we really had to dig into that telephone to find the date. And it was the November the 6th of 2011. My experience had been November the 3rd of 2011. One of the local girls in our support group, Jennifer Hall, she also had a major experience within a couple of days of my experience. And then my parents had those three sightings all in the same time period. So even though, you know, I found this picture later with her, even with my parents' experiences, I just didn't want to think of it as anything more than a dream. Now, two months later, uh, well, first let me just tell you this. Um, my husband, when I had that dream, I told him, I woke up and I was in a panic. And I called him on the phone and I said, where are you? And he said, I'm dropping our daughter off at school. And I thought, oh, of course that's where you are. Because he, I was just so disoriented. I just had no idea you know, which, which end it was up at that point. And I said, can you please come home? So he knew that something was up and that I was very distraught from that experience. But fast forward two months later in January of 2012, I had another experience where I was wide awake. And what happened then was I was laying in bed reading, and I do this every night. I have my little book light and I'm reading my book, and it was around three or four in the morning. Um, I'll sleep a little bit, and then I'll wake up, read a little bit, and then go back to sleep. So I had been reading. I put my book light away. I put the book down beside my nightstand, and I started to get snuggled under the covers. And then I heard a noise in my living room. And then I heard another noise in the kitchen. So I went to wake my husband up like I normally would in that kind of a situation. And I couldn't move. I was completely paralyzed except for my eyeballs. And a blue light just flooded the whole room and I heard a loud hum in my right ear that was unlike anything I had ever heard before. 
And I, in that moment, I thought, oh gosh, that November dream wasn't a dream. Like I felt very confirmed in that moment. So I can hear scurrying, like little children running around the room, but I couldn't see them. And my, because I could move my eyeballs, I slowly moved them to my right, which was the side of the bed that my husband slept on. And just in my line of vision, I saw a little gray. And the only difference was that it was glowing blue. It was blue, like that electric kind of blue that you would see on a DVD player or your TV. And I remember thinking, well, that's odd. You know, the blueness. And I was out. Everything went black. Uh, the same thing with the ship. When I was sucked up into that beam of light, everything went black. So I don't know what happened there, at least not consciously. I woke up about an hour later from this experience. And of course, I went to wake up my husband to tell him what had happened. And I could barely get the words out. And he could barely get his words out. Now, normally when I wake up my husband in the middle of the night for something, if I hear a noise, he hops right to it and, you know, he, it doesn't take him long to wake up. So I'm trying to have this conversation and we're both just slurring our words and our limbs felt really rubbery. And I always describe this as that feeling that you might get after you've had surgery and you're coming out of anesthesia. Um, so if any of you have had that, that's kind of what it felt like. So that, for me, that was the big, the big, the big one. Uh, that was the one that the next day, we fell asleep after that, we, for about two or three more hours. And the next day I was getting ready in the bathroom and I had what we call in the South a come apart. <laughs> now my husband and I, we've, we've at this point been together, it was about 11 years at that when this was going on. He had never seen me dramatic like that. He had never seen me lose it because I, that just isn't who I am. So he knew, some, okay, something is going on here. Uh, and he, he held me, he listened to me. And I was so afraid. And I was afraid on many different levels. Uh, you know, I, of course I was afraid of what had just happened because it broke my paradigm. And I always tell people, if it was an angel or a ghost, I'd probably handle that a lot better because for most of us, that fits the paradigm that we've been raised with. Um, but not so much extraterrestrials or interdimensionals. So I was afraid of what had just happened. And then I was afraid for my family. You know, is this gonna happen to them? My daughter, uh, I think was eight at the time, I was afraid of, would they think I'm crazy? And then I was afraid of, what if I am crazy? So it was so many different levels of fear, fearing all of that. And of course, I wanted to process it. I wanted to talk to somebody about it, and I did not know where to go. Now, there were a lot of synchronicities leading up uh, to this that I don't have time to go into up here, but I'll be happy to talk to you after if you're interested and they will be in the book um, But I immediately started googling and the first person I came across was Whitley Streeper And I saw the book cover and I remembered that book cover from back when I was in high school and I shot him off a panicked letter <laughs> And he got back to me in about 30 minutes, which I, I thought was just amazing and he said that my story sounded really similar to this other man from Australia that had contributed to the communion letters. So of course I was Googling the communion letters. I'm like, oh, I've got to read all these other people's stories and see, and I couldn't find it. So I wrote back and I said, is it out of print? And he said, it is, but he copied that particular story and emailed that to me so I could read it and make comparisons. And he did not know of any local support groups in my area, which is in Nashville, Tennessee. And there weren't, really weren't any that he could recommend online. So then I, I found MUFON, and that, that was part of my big synchronicity. 
And after several tries, uh, I finally heard from Kathleen Martin and Denise Stoner. And I always say they were my angels because I really needed them. I needed to hear what they had to say to me. I needed them to hear me out with all I had been going through. And it was just such a relief to have some, you know, educated intellectual women who were very experienced in this field to kind of hold my hand through that beginning. And my husband and I took part in the commonality study that they did with me as an experiencer and he had as a non-experiencer. Now, a couple of months after that, I was laying in bed. <coughs> My, my clicker's not working. <laughs> oh, there we go. I had had a dream, nothing related to ETs. I, we, I dreamt we were moving into this house and there was room after room after room and people and people and people in all these rooms. And I woke up around seven in the morning and I thought, I'm trying to analyze this dream. And all of a sudden I hear a male voice just come streaming through my mind. And it was crystal clear. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> I've told this story a hundred times and I'm just lining it up with the PowerPoint of my doing that. So this was the quote that came through. Organized religion and dogma complicates the evolution of our soul. Pure love and simple heart truths gently moves us in our ascension process. And I had my telephone by the bed and I knew immediately to pick it up and open the notepad and jot this down. But this did not come from me. I mean, I heard the voice and it was it was amazing how crystal clear it was and I thought you know that that I could experience every day it was a lovely experience um, some of these I'm going to go through kind of quickly um, just due to time I had an experience with uh, a council of beings the hooded beings and this happened in August of 2012 and with this, I was standing in front of this woman who was sitting down, and she had the hood on, so I could not really see her face. And I'm not an artist, so please excuse any of, you know, these five-year-old looking drawings and paintings. <laughs> but I could feel people on either side of me, and I could feel people on each side of her, but I couldn't really see them. So she was really the focal point. And she said, Follow the eagle. The wisdom of the eagle is not new. It is ancient. Listen to the eagle. And she kept repeating it over and over and over again. And I thought, okay, lady, I've got it. And I, of course, you know, I came out of that. I looked up all types of eagle symbolism and um, I, nothing, I, I don't know what it meant. And I think it probably still remains to be seen what it did mean. I don't know if this was an astral experience or a physical experience. Sometimes it's hard to tell. And you know, we all go through different phases of brainwave activity during the day. Uh, we go from the highest, which is a beta state, to alpha, to theta, to delta. And when you're drifting off to sleep, you know, you're going through that theta phase before you hit delta, which is, is the, sleep, the, the sleep phase. Um, theta is where most meditators aim to get. When you're really in deep meditation, that is what's, going, you're between four and 7.9 hertz there. And that's when a lot of mystical experiences happen. So when I hear people dismiss any of this um, as hypnagog hypnagogic or hypnopompic, you know, hallucinations, and that's when you're going from wake to sleep or sleep to wake, or just sleep paralysis, I wonder, could it be both? Because if you think about how many people that lose a loved one, and then they have a visitation from them, and it's often when they're drifting off to sleep or when they're waking up in the morning. 
So granted, it may be, yeah, it's sleep paralysis or it's just this hypnagogic state, but there could really be something else happening there too. Because there's so much about our consciousness that we don't know. I mean, it's a, it really is the great mystery. So I just hate to hear it dismissed as that. When, I mean, there is that. But there's been so many times where I'm a big fan of Graham Hancock, and he tells the story about shamans that will go into the other world, and they'll come back with a physical manifestation, such as a seed in their hand that they're told to use with other plants to heal people. So a physical manifestation comes back from that. And think of how many of us wake up with marks in the morning. And so there's been a physical manifestation that clearly happened, even if it was just an astral experience. Now, my daughter and I had gone to see a movie, and they showed the Smurfs preview. And she knew about the blue being experience because you know, it shook me to my core. It was really hard to hide that from her. And as they're showing the little Smurfs on the screen, I leaned over to her and I said, maybe that blue guy was really just a little Smurf. And that night we were home and again, I was reading between three and four in the morning. And I was laying on my left side when I finally settled in. And I heard a hum, and this time it was in my left ear. And I really tried to just calm myself. And the paralysis was very, very mild. And I could feel something. So I wanted to get on my back to try to see what that was. And I could just barely, you know, just barely lean back a little bit. And when I did, a woman's voice came through and she said, you need to pay attention to your smart. And I know a lot of you probably know Jim O'Connell, who is a researcher and an experiencer. And you know, he said to me once, you know, they either have a really good sense of humor or they're taking us very literally. And I wonder, it's hard to tell, you know, if, if, which one it is. Um, but then I turned back to my left, the hum came back, I turned back onto my back, and then I started to see rapid film strips going by of disasters. And these were both natural disasters and man-made disasters. And I mean, it was just zipping by. And of course, later on, I learned that that's a thing, that a lot of experience will see or shown the film strip of disasters. And then I fell to, a, to, into a sleep where I proceeded to dream that there was a large city like New York or Los Angeles, and there was a huge storm cloud over it, and people were just scrambling to get to safety. And what I find interesting about that is I could distinguish that that was a dream, whereas, you know, her talking about the Smurf and showing me the film strip was not. It just, in my head, the other part of it was a dream. I also had an experience where I felt as if my cells were dissipating. Uh, it was an amazing feeling, and it reminded me of what near-death experiencers describe when they talk about that all-encompassing love, and they don't want to come back. And I actually thought for a second while it was happening that maybe I was dying. And I just, I mean, the only way I can describe it is my cells were dissipating. For those of you familiar with Jim Sparks, he talks about being taken the easy way and being taken the hard way. And with this experience, I wondered, well, maybe I was coming or going the easy way. And the hard way being the way I described in that first slide of being sucked up into that being. I had an experience again with my daughter. We were laying in bed just having a conversation and our dresser and television are in front of the bed. And I could see this portal open and all this air was rippling. And I said to her, do you see that? And she could not see that. And it only lasted a few seconds. And that was, that was a really interesting thing too. And, and in the support group online, we talked about that 
maybe just something was opening from an inner dimension that I was seeing in or they were seeing in at me. I'm not sure. Now, my husband is a children's entertainer, and there's his little alien balloon. And he was getting ready to go on a business trip for four nights to this big balloon convention that happens every year. And I was majorly stressed out because this was the first time I was going to be alone without him. And granted, he is rendered useless when an experience is happening, but he's always there for the aftermath. So I, uh, I, I implored two things. Um, I had heard that if you ask to be left alone, they will listen. And I've utilized this two other times. The first time was with a possible implant that was behind my ear. And I thought it was just a cyst. It lasted about eight months. And so I thought, I'm gonna ask to just have them remove it. And it wasn't 24 hours later that that was gone after being there for eight months. The second time, I had had a couple of weeks of just a lot of minor activity, but I was really tired. And I said, can you please just give me a break? Uh, and I think I got it. Uh, a lot of folks will say, well, you just think you got it. They're still doing stuff, but you're not, they're not letting you remember. And I'm like, that's good too. I'll take that. <laughs> So I also, as a hypnotherapist, I specialize in EFT, emotional freedom technique, which is also known as the tapping technique. And with, with the reason that therapy is effective is because our emotions are nothing more than a disruption in our body's energy system. So if you've ever seen an acupuncturist and they're putting needles, they're clearing the disruption in your energy system. Um, and I can answer more questions about that afterwards, how it works, because of a neat story about how that was discovered. But you know how the cobbler's son has no shoes. It, it probably took me close to a year to figure out, oh, I do this thing with other people that helps them get over things, and I need to do this on myself. So about four days before he left, I was tapping and doing the EFT for my fear and anxiety. And I sailed through his whole being gone. I mean, it was just, I was so proud of myself. And before he left, I had said, again, please don't bother me for these next four days. You know, just don't bother me. When he came home, and I was full of pride, uh, I jokingly said, the portal's back open. my little portal that I painted. Um, the next morning, I was talking to my mother on the telephone, and I was kind of just, you know, fiddling with the side of my knee. And I find these three bumps in a perfect triangle formation. And they didn't itch, they didn't hurt, they weren't anywhere else on my body. I did an interview with Rick Schooler from Topic UFO, and he put this the white triangle in to really define that. And again, I thought, humor? You know, here I said the portal's back open. Was this just their way of saying, okay, here we are. Um, I don't recall anything happening during that night, but that was what I had woken up with. Now, in May of 2013, um, one of the things I, I tell people to help change the energy, since a lot of this happens in our home or our bedroom, is to change the room around, just rearrange things. Um, we could not do that with our bedroom, the way all the electronics were set up, so we switched sides of the bed. And it was amazingly therapeutic for me, switching sides of the bed. Um, my anxiety level greatly dropped. So one night, around three o'clock in the morning, I feel the mild paralysis come on. And I could sense something happening over to my right. But I didn't want to look over there. So I kind of looked over to my husband. And I thought, should I wake him up? And then I thought, no, it's not going to work anyway. Just relax. Breathe through it. And this, you know, I've talked to people about practicing your experiences, meaning 
breathe through it. Just kind of try to roll with it. When you feel that paralysis come on or you're seeing something or hearing something, you know, we'll often hear chirping or cicada type sounds and just roll with it. Um, I got through it. My husband got up around five in the morning and that woke me up and I told him what happened. And he said, well, are you okay? You know, do you need me to hold you? And I'm like, no, I'm good. And again, there was a sense of pride that I had gotten through it. Well, I got up to go to the bathroom and I felt something on my stomach. And I looked down and this is what was there. It was like a pinprick with a scratch and then another little scratch. So this happened on May 13th of 2013. A few days later on Facebook, I see that somebody posted this. A crop circle that was formed on Gray Station Road in Gray, Tennessee, the very same night that I had this other experience. Humor? I don't know. I mean, you hardly ever hear of crop circles here, and especially in Tennessee. Uh, and then the name of the road and the town, I just thought was very interesting. I'm gonna just touch on my childhood briefly. I grew up in North Reading, Massachusetts, which is kind of on the North Shore, close to the New Hampshire border. I have a childhood memories that I didn't think a lot of until all of these conscious experiences started happening. But I was a sleepwalker from about age four to 11, and I was always heading out our back door. We had a large yard that segued into our neighbor's field. I'd have frequent bloody noses and had to be cauterized at one point. I was afraid of the dark, which of course is an unusual for a child. But you know, it's on the list when people ask about abduction experiences. I also had fear of my closets, my windows, under the bed. But the windows and closets especially, I, the windows, I had two coming into my little room, and I just always felt like something was watching me. I always felt safest if my bed was against the wall. I can remember being touched on my shoulder and it not being my parents. And I can remember being dropped in the bed gently and it not being my parents. I can remember hearing my name in my ear, even as an adult. I can remember a doll floating gently off my bed one evening. And this was weird. My parents are both Catholic, but not practicing. And I was being raised in a Baptist church, just me. They didn't go with me. And they dropped me off for Sunday school. And, and I stayed in that church until I was about 21. But I had this need to have an altar in my bedroom. And my mom had these little Jesus, Mary, and Joseph figures that I just had to have. And I had to put them on that altar. And I would sit there and meditate is what I was doing. I didn't know it at the time, but when I look back, I, I, I have clear memories of this. And I would just sit quietly and meditate with them. I also had a sighting with my parents when I was around 20, where we had come back from an outing and in the backyard over that field, there were two balls of light slowly moving from right to left, no sound at all. And I even went in and called the local police to see had anybody else reported it. And at the time, they said no. And we finally just went into the house and just said, okay, <laughs> and just kind of let it be. Uh, in this, the online support group that's led by Misha Johnston, she would often give us surveys and questionnaires. You know, are you an abductee? Are you a hybrid? Those kinds of things. And there's often 50 questions. And they say if you have 25 or more, you're probably that thing. And I was always up in the 40, 45 mark. So I'm like, okay. But one of the questions she'd always ask is, did you have a larger than normal baby head? And I always said no. And then one day I came across this picture. <laughs> and I thought, now that's a larger than normal baby head. Um, and you know, my, I've always had bangs my whole life. My mom gave me bangs as a kid. I still have bangs. Uh, and now I know why, because she was trying to hide that. <laughs> so since all of 
this has been happening. My parents don't like this topic at all, um, especially my father, who has had the most experiences. I'm adopted also, um, and I know there's talk of does it run in family lines, and the fact that I am adopted and that my parents have had experiences, I don't, I don't know what that means, but I just thought I would let you know that. So my mom and I were, t were talking about the subject one day, and this is months after you know, being sucked up in the ship and having the blue being in my room. And my mom said, do you remember Crazy Patty that used to live across the street? And I said, yeah. And, and Patty and her husband were elderly when I was a little kid, so they have long passed. And she said, well, you know, every night, Patty would get up on that roof in her nightgown, and she would wait for the ships to come in. And I just looked at my mother dumbfounded. And I said, you're just now telling me this? <laughs> With all I've been through? This is a really important piece of information. So she said, well, I'm sorry, but yeah, you know, she was always talking about it. She'd always call me and she swore that there were burnt out marks in the field and she was always wanting me to come see them and I never would. So this is a map. We were the last house on the left down there and Patty's house was across the street. She had a teeny tiny yard and I said, well, where was she seeing them? Land. And she said, well, in the field next to ours. So that's the neighbor's field. This is a close-up shot. Now, there's the back door that I would always be heading out. And my dad had to eventually put locks way up high so that I wouldn't go out there in the middle of the night. And then that's the large field where she would see them land from her home. Now, my daughter has also had some experiences. Um, she woke up one morning with a band of like hickey marks across her chest and her waist. And they went from under her arm across. And these are really close up just for the sake of privacy. I didn't want to show her, her whole torso. Um, but I called the doctor. She said, take her to the emergency room. So we did. And I'm thinking the worst. I'm Googling all this stuff, you know, thinking it's the worst thing. She's got leukemia or something. Something's making the blood pool up near her skin. And they took a blood test. Everything was completely normal. Uh, two doctors looked at her. They kept looking at us. And they just kept shaking their heads. And they said, we don't know what it is. So her diagnosis was NOS, not otherwise specified. And they said, just keep an eye on it. And it went away in a few days. Uh, and I was telling this story in the group, and, and David Chase had said that, the, that there was a guy that spoke at a MUFON meeting in 2007. I forget his name, David. You, you can't think, okay. He normally has a memory like a vice. <laughs> um, but he talked about how children are not often paralyzed, that they are strapped down. And so the marks were completely where you would put straps if you were strapping down a kid. Dan Wright? Okay, okay. <laughs> this other picture on the left is my boob. Yep. Is everybody awake now? <laughs> my husband noticed this. Um, we took it in close up picture so as not to show the whole boob. Um, but <laughs> these marks are identical to her marks. And this was, her, the, hers was in May, well, not this past May, but the May before and mine were just a few months ago, so almost a year later. And I had sent these to Kathy Martin, and she had said she's seen this a few times. I don't know how common it is, but very unusual. Didn't itch, didn't hurt, just exactly like a hickey. Um, now, she also, if anyone's familiar with the Bratz dolls, they look kind of alien-like, and she had a dream where she was being followed by them over a candy bridge. And granted, that could have just been a dream. But you know, being through what I've been through, I thought, you know, that could have been a screen memory for her. She also told me a story. Now, she, again, she's been privy to a lot of what I've been through, but she did not know this. And she started to tell me about this dream she had where she was in a circular room and a man that looked like Albert Einstein wheeled in this computer that looked kind of like a pyramid with a lot of buttons on it. And he put it in front of her, and he told her, you need to fix this. And he set a timer. And she even went into the detail of telling me there was a molded seat that was attached to it for her to sit on. 
to do her thing. And she said it was kind of like the little seats that you see on the kitty rides at a Chuck E. Cheese or a little kid's amusement park, you know, they're molded. And so, and I thought that was an interesting detail. And so she was very panicked because she thought, I don't think I'm gonna get this done in time. And the, the timer went off, she did not get it finished. And then myself and my mother showed up in the doorway and she said, you looked like zombies. She said, you were there, but you really weren't there. And you took me away. To me, that sounded a lot like what people describe where they're being taught something or given drills to do on a ship. Um, so that really got my attention. Another thing is, and I don't know how related this is at all, and I don't know if anyone's heard of this, so please let me know if you have. She and I had a shared dream about bees one night, and she woke up the next morning to tell me she said, I dreamt about all these bees. And I said, I dreamt about all these bees. And it was such a bizarre thing. And each of us have had several bee dreams since that shared dream. Um, she and I have also witnessed orbs in our bedroom flying, flying through the room. And the first time it happened, I remember, I said, did you see that? She said, yeah, did you see that? And it was, that was such a validation for me that, okay, you know, I'm not the only one seeing these things. And she has seen several since then. These are marks that showed up on my husband. Uh, he came to me and showed me. There's a, like a three bruise mark on the elbow, three on the hip, and then a, a triangle mark on his shoulder. These are just some drawings um, of ships that I've done. And again, excuse the artwork. The picture on the lower left was something I drew repeatedly as a 12-year-old. They're not the pyramids of Giza. It was a house that I was sure I lived in, in a different star system. And I never thought much about that until recently, and I wondered why. This is another kind of being that showed up, had a name. I don't remember a lot of details. This is another one, and Audrey, for those of you familiar with her story, she, I showed her this and she had a strong reaction to it too. This was in the Fairy Magazine by Sam Robertson. I started a Facebook group called Symbols and Star Writing uh, because this was something else that cropped up and I'll be happy to answer any questions after about that. Uh, if any of you have had the number patterns, that was part of my prep work, was seeing these number patterns, and I still see them. And not just on clocks, I see them on receipts and license plates and addresses. We talk about PTSD a lot, and again, I'm not going to go through all of this. Another thing I think that we suffer from is adrenal fatigue syndrome. Uh, your adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys, they are your stress hormones. And if you're under repeated stress, they kind of, sh they're exhausted. They shoot it all out and you'll have a lot of these symptoms. And I think that's something probably that needs to be looked into with experiencers. Quickly, I'm gonna go through the toolbox that I kind of developed for myself and now use with other people. Uh, this is gonna be in my book, but I'm thinking of making a separate book with this expanded. We know about hypnotherapy, Thankfully, psychotherapy, we have people to turn to now. EFT, meditation, sound therapy. If you're not a good meditator, I suggest going to find a Reiki therapist or the reconnection, healing touch, crystal therapy, aromatherapy, shamanic journeying. That's been a wonderful one for me. Breath work, working with your dream time, learning to lucid dream to give you some control. Chanting and mantras, of course, journaling your experiences, sacred plant medicine, which is a nice way of saying hallucinogenic plants, which I've not done yet. I hope to. Um, Mike Cleland has a friend, Shauna Holm, that wrote a wonderful book called Love and Spirit Medicine about her experiences with these. Support groups like Starborn Support. And of course, this won't expand your consciousness, but a nightlight <laughs> or a salt lamp is wonderful. And I'll leave you with this quote, delusion doesn't create doubt from the afterlife of Billy Finger. So if you're doubting yourself, if you're questioning yourself, that's a good thing. This is my website. 
Uh, the book I'm hoping will be out early next year. Kathleen Martin was kind enough to write the foreword. Denise Stoner, Brett Oldham, Suzanne Chancellor are all contributing, as well as Chris Hancock, who's here with me today. He is our team psychotherapist in Tennessee, and our whole group is going to be writing their own little chapter in there. The end. <laughs> <laughs>